This video is about oxygen transport by hemoglobin. We know hemoglobin molecule transports oxygen from lungs to tissues. One hemoglobin molecule transports about four oxygen molecules. Here in this structure we have the hemoglobin molecule. It's having four polypeptide chains and each chain has one heme group, polypyrin ring and one iron atom shown in the diagram. If we see the molecular structure without polypeptide chains, here we have four hemoglobin subunits forming tetramer. And to the iron atoms that's in all these four subunits, we see the oxygen binds as shown in the animation. The O2 binds Fe ions via coordinate covalent bond. Before we get to the transport process, it must be noted that hemoglobin exists in two forms. The monod wem and chen model describes hemoglobin as existing in two conformations, the relaxed form and tense form. The relaxed form exists in lungs and is having high oxygen affinity, whereas the tense form exists in tissues and is having low oxygen affinity. Now let's get to the oxygen transport process. Here in this diagram we have the alveoli tiny air sacs in the lungs containing oxygen that just enter during the inhalation process. First of all, let's see oxygen pickup in the lungs. Here in this diagram, we have the alveolus on one side and the pulmonary capillary carrying venous blood on the other side. In the alveolus, the partial pressure of oxygen PO2 is around 100 mm Hg. Whereas in the incoming venous blood, the PO2 is only about 40 mm Hg. So we have a capillary oxygen gradient, about 60 mmHg difference. And oxygen naturally moves from the alveolus into the blood, as shown in the diagram. This process follows Fick's law of diffusion, which states that rate of diffusion is directly proportional to A into D into P1 minus P2 divided by T, where A is surface area for diffusion, D is diffusion coefficient of Gas P1 minus P2 is the difference in partial pressures across the membranes. Here it's 100 mmHg minus 40 mmHg. T is the thickness of the membrane. Because the surface area is large, the gradient is big and the membrane is thin, oxygen loads very quickly. Second point is the cooperative binding and attaining the R state, that's relaxed state. For that we have to see what happens inside the red blood cells. We see hemoglobin arrives mostly in the T state. This means it has low affinity for oxygen but not zero affinity. That high PO2 in the alveolus 100 mmHg allows the first O2 molecule to bind even in the T state. Once the first O2 binds, it triggers a conformational change. This shifts hemoglobin into the R state that's relaxed state which has high affinity for oxygen. Now the remaining heme sites fill rapidly. This is the cooperative binding. Another factor here in the lungs is the reverse Bohr effect. Low CO2 levels because CO2 diffuses out of the alveolus. High pH, slightly lower temperature than tissues. All of these conditions stabilizes the R state, increasing hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen and promoting maximal oxygen loading. From here, oxygen diffuses across the alveolar membrane into the blood. About 1.5% of the oxygen is simply dissolved in plasma, while the remaining 98.5% binds to the hemoglobin molecules inside red blood cells, forming oxyhemoglobin molecule HbO2. This oxygen-rich blood is then carried to the left atrium of the heart, which pumps it towards tissues. When oxyhemoglobin reaches the tissues, the hemoglobin releases oxygen to supply the body's cells. Here is a brief outlook on how O2 is unloaded into the tissues. The first key factor is the tissue blood PO2 gradient. In the arterial blood, PO2 is about 100 mmHg, while in resting tissues it's around 40 mmHg. This difference drives oxygen to diffuse from hemoglobin in red blood cells into tissues. When the first O2 molecule leaves hemoglobin, it destabilizes the R state, making the molecule more likely to shift towards the T state, that's tense state. In the T state, hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen is lower. 
so the remaining O2 molecules are released more easily, a classic example of cooperative unloading. The second factor is the Bohr's effect. In metabolically active tissues, we see high CO2 levels, low pH, high temperatures and increased 2-3 BPG levels. All these changes stabilize the T-state of hemoglobin. Further lowering it is oxygen affinity and promoting O2 unloading, right where the tissues need it the most. The hemoglobin molecule is now deoxygenated. At this point, carbon dioxide produced by tissues as a metabolic waste product is loaded into the blood. This happens in three main ways. About 70% of carbon dioxide is converted into bicarbonate ions HCO3 and is then transported. Whereas 20-25% to binds directly to the hemoglobin to form carb amino hemoglobin molecule HBCO2. The remaining 5-10% to is dissolved directly into the plasma. We see the carbon rich blood is then transported back to the right atrium and eventually to the alveoli where carbon dioxide is exhaled and the cycle starts again. So this marks the end of oxygen transport by hemoglobin molecules. Now in the next video we will be discussing about the oxygen dissociation curve. I hope you like the video. If you like it, give it a thumbs up. Do consider supporting my work on Patreon or YouTube and make sure to subscribe to the channel. Thanks.